Um, welcome everybody. My name is Carter Newbies. I'm on the steering committee uh, for the MPA. Um, and I'm our facilitator tonight. I feel weird not having Tom up here and doing it myself, but um, yeah, Tom and Carol are both um, traveling or otherwise um, indisposed. So we're stuck with me tonight. Um, so yeah, I got my agenda right here. So like always, um, we're just gonna go around, share name, what street you're on, do formal introductions, and then we'll do announcements. So like sharing events, any community activities, et cetera. Um, and I see there's a mic right there and there. Do we wanna start on this side of the room and sort of move our way around? Um, sure. Uh, hi, my name's Harry. I uh, live on Dan's Court. Um, I'm Robert, also on Dan's Court. I'm Jasper, also on Dan's Court. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah it's like a little ways up from roller it's a little private road yeah. um hi my name is michelle um we actually live in essex junction but um here as a guest welcome uh, my name is emily i live on prospect hill oh, that's nice to Oh, yeah, there's another mic down there too. Okay. I'm Karen Long on Henry Street. I'm Catherine Verman. I live on North Street. Richard Hilliard, I Grove Court. And I think the last people to be at an MPA from uh, Dan's Court was David Zuckerman. <laughs> so that dates that. <laughs> he still owns property there. I'm Pat Seelan. I live on Nash Place. Hi, I'm Tim Doherty. I live on Colonial Square. And my son, Sam, who lives with me on Colonial Square. Hi, I'm Dave Colley. I live on Nash Place and part of the Old East End. Joel Collada on 20 Chase Street, Old East End. Samantha Ayat, 20 Chase Street, Old East End as well. Hi, I'm Troy Hedrick. I live on Billy Court. I also am one of two state reps serving Chittenden 15 in the house. Uh, Brian's coming shortly, the other one. Hi, I'm Jonathan Chapel Sokol. I live on North Prospect Street, and I, I'm just watching Charlie do hand signals, so I'm... This stays over here. Okay. Jonathan Chapel Sogol, North Prospect Street, and I'm on the steering committee as well. I'm Rob Bettman, and I live on North Lincoln. Hi, I'm Susan. I live on the corner of East Lincoln and East Village Drive. Pro Green, and also live in Pearl Housing. I'm East Village Drive. I'm Peter Lukowski, Pearl Housing, East Village Drive, which is East Gallery. Is that everybody? Do we miss anybody? Oh, yeah. I, I forgot about you all. I'm sorry. Oh, and there's Carol. <laughs> um, do you, the folks on Zoom want to jump in? And maybe Carol and Gary, you could start. Hi, I'm Carol Livingston. I live on Calarco Court, um, and I'm on the steering committee. And I'm Gary Golden. I'm the school commissioner for the East District, which for new people includes Ward 1 and 8. Uh, Sophie Quest, J Street, and uh, Old East End. Who goes next? <laughs> I think you got it, yeah. I'm Gina Cohousing. Sharon, you want to send it? Oh, certainly. Sharon, Sharon Bush, East, East Avenue. Avenue. And then, oh, that's just Sam. Carter, uh, newbies are over on Colchester, Colchester Avenue. I almost said Clarko Court. Um, sweet. Um, so any announcements before we move to speak out? Just community events, anything that's happening that you want to share with folks? Oh, I can go. Yeah, Joel. 
So along with the old East End, I and Dave have been putting together a project to assess walkability, livability, traffic issues, uh, infrastructure issues. Um, we're calling it the People Powered Neighborhood Project. It has its first uh, tent uh, pop-up event this Friday, and we'll have another on Sunday. Um, these will be announced in Front Porch Forum. Um, but if you have time on Friday or Sunday, keep your eyes open for the tent down at Triangle Park on Chase Street. Uh, we'll be looking for input on how the neighborhood can be more walkable, more livable. Um, we're not going to be able to deal with the amount of traffic that comes through there, but we are hoping to send the message that this is a space for people, where people live and where residents can thrive. And we're hoping to get input and collect data from residents so that we can do some projects uh, coming in the fall. Anything I missed with it? So we'll be calling for volunteers. I'm not going to rattle off the whole uh, list right now, but keep your eyes posted on Front Porch Forum if you'd like to uh, help out. We'll have opportunities all throughout the summer. So if you're in Centennial, yeah, yeah, because you might want to post like I'm in one east. Yeah, make sure you go to all the. Yeah, yeah if you send it to me, I can post in one. Yeah. Okay, sure. I think don't don't I have the option to share to neighboring communities? Yeah, yeah but it won't. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I can share to you, uh, Jonathan, and we can make sure it gets around to the surrounding areas. Any other announcements? Yeah. So this is um, this is the I think this is the last. NPA meeting for the spring. Um, on So on July 15th, the Fletcher Free Library will be celebrating its 150th anniversary. And there's going to be a parade down Church Street where you can go and dress up as your favorite character or your favorite author. And then there are all sorts of events at the library itself, um, cake, music, entertainment. Um, and this will be on this will be on July 15th. It'll be on the Saturday. And you're all welcome to come. There will be more notices on Front Porch Forum and around on it. But we hope to have a good turnout. Thanks. Who are you going as? <laughs> well, <clears throat> I'm working on my Charles Darwin beard, actually. Oh. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to make it because it's so irritating. <laughs> but um, I have one quick one. Uh, we This is the last meeting until September for MPA in person. So we're taking July just as a reminder. July and August off, and then July 9th is the community picnic? August, August 9th, sorry. Um, yeah, August 9th, we're doing a picnic at Shemanska Park, and we'll send out more details on FPF and the email list. Um, and great plug, if you didn't sign in, um, but you want to get emails about just MPA agendas and then wrap up and any community events we mentioned, um, just make sure you sign in and put your email down, and you'll get on that. We're... I think at 45 folks and growing. So we're getting there. Um, sweet. All right. Any more going once, going twice? I think I got <laughs> this being the last meeting, I have a feeling this is Sam's last meeting with us. Is that right? Yeah. So I think we all, I, Sam really deserves a lot of praise and applause for all the incredible hard work he's done over the last couple of years in keeping this and every NPA meeting running smoothly, efficiently, um, dealing with in-person and on the TV, um, just all the help you've given us, everything you've done for us has been so appreciated. You're, you've got are they? I don't know, big shoes, little shoes. There's shoes to follow in that we we're just so happy that you could could give us all you've given us in the last couple of years. So I just want to say thank you. Yeah, yeah, he's done his service. Yeah, this is internship. Carol, did you have anything you want to share as well? Or you might be frozen. It was just, I was just going to um, um, thank Sam, and I'm glad um, Jonathan went ahead and did that. I also, 
Um, one of the um, as a steering committee throughout the city is the steering committees of each of the eight wards has uh, um, an all wards meeting or twice a year. Um, and Sam has been instrumental in uh, facilitating those and um, ensuring that we we have those meetings and are able to um, sort of share our ideas and and work together. Um, and thank you so much for that leadership. You broke up a little bit, Carol, but I think we we did get most of it in the in the gist. Um, okay, I guess we'll move to any other yeah, move to speak out unless there's any other announcements. We're officially in speak out. Um, so speak out, you can share anything on your mind. We put twenty minutes on the on the clock before city council updates. Um, could be about anything in the community issues in front of city council, city government, all those good things. Yeah, Richard. I received a call in the middle of the night from Jared Wood. So I'm representing what he would uh, uh, find absolutely appalling. Um, I heard from a, a pretty unimpeachable source um, last week that the city gains revenue of about one and a half million dollars a year from parking, parking offenses. And they don't gain anything from um, traffic enforcement because there isn't any. But the um, before that policy was put in place, we only got 50,000 from traffic enforcement fines and that sort of thing. I know that a police lieutenant that I worked with um, issued $2,000 worth of fines in a two hour detail. And I know public safety is later in the, in the agenda, but I wonder whether we're doing these things right. Um, we're not, it, it's not safe not to have any traffic enforcement. Um, in certain other countries, someone was fined $127,000 in Finland a few weeks ago for a traffic offence. A well-known soccer player was fined 92000 in Newcastle in England fairly recently, and the Archbishop of Canterbury, believe it or not, um, just after the coronation, got done for um, going 33 in a 30 mile an hour limit uh, and had to pay about 250 bucks. So um, I would urge anyone uh, who is influential in this to assess whether or not we're serving the public and public safety well by concentrating all our enforcement on parking offenses and not on speeding, going through red lights and all the rest of the stuff I see when I'm a, uh, a crossing guard. So thanks for listening. Thank you, Jared. Carter. Yeah, Sharon, I got you in the queue, but Charlie, you wanna add something quick? Okay, so people might be interested to know that beginning uh, just before Christmas, the number of people actually writing tickets increased from about three people to 13 for parking, for yeah. parking enforcement. So that might have something to do with it. Yeah. Sharon, I saw you um, wanted to jump in though. Um, yes. I, I wanted to say that um, I think that uh other counselors that were on the council um, in 2019 or so, um, the police commission, you know, did a report on um, traffic stops and there was a correlation between people's race and the number of times they were stopped. And the way that this community and not just our community, but others in Vermont dealt with that was to stop doing traffic stops. And I that isn't really solving the problem. If you have a 
problem that suggests discrimination, you have to address why that's happening. You don't just stop enforcement. And I've brought this up and I thank you, um, Richard, for mentioning this. I think that the, the counselors that will be ones here, and I, I don't know if Soraya's on, on, on the call, um, on the meeting, but I think the council needs to, needs to address that with the police um, to begin that again. And I understand the relative risk, but then you need to address that discrimination. You don't just let violators go through. It's very frustrating. But while I have this um, moment, I wanted to bring to your attention that, you know, I, I still follow um, the city council and board of finance meetings. And I speak now at the board of finance and the council is about to do one of their most important things is to adopt the budget that the mayor presents. And um, I have voiced concern because there are some increases. And you also know that there's going to be a rate increase for BED water and wastewater. Um, and the, there is charter authority to allow the council without asking the public to increase um, the amount of money that is dedicated to parks. It's a tree belt ordinance. I unfortunately know about that because it was done years ago when I was on the council, but, um, but they're going to increase that. And so they did do a synopsis at the last meeting and they said for a house that was valued at $370,000, the anticipated impact would be $207 per year school tax. Once again, that's income sensitive. So for those that are struggling, there may be relief from the state. However, for the city, it would be $136. That's the tax that doesn't increase the increase for um, the utilities that I referenced. And I spoke because I feel that the council needs to look at the affordability. The mayor has asked added a lot of positions and reclassified a lot of positions. And although I want to absolutely um, compensate people fairly, we used to look at what was recommended and then put this overlay of what Burlingtonians could afford. And I spoke to the fact that I think that that process of that overlay for affordability has been lost. And that's not going to only impact homeowners because it's going to impact renters also. And so I'm very concerned as I live here and hear more people thinking that they might have to move out of Burlington that have lived here a long time. And I just wanted to share that with this NPA because I care about us and I wanted all of you to know. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Sharon. Thank you. Um, Mike, Sharon, I agree. I know people who have moved out, people that are my age that lived here a long time because our taxes are ridiculous. Um, <clears throat> and I also echo what Richard said, but it was Del Pozo and John Murad who came to our NPA maybe five years ago and said, they don't do traffic tickets because it hurt people's morale. And if people remember it, yeah. And so Cindy, Cindy Cook got somebody to do like a speed thing on East Avenue. And I think it was a four hour thing or you did it. Well, you and Cindy, anyway, whatever. I just remember it. And it was, a, they collected, cause there's people speeding on East Avenue all the time and they got a lot of money just once they only did it so i agree they should be you know changing that so that people are not being hit on the street um, when they're walking more people would walk if they felt it was safer but what my um speak out was about was i did go to the took meeting last night um about the bed plan to build the pipeline for the steam from the intervale up to UVM, 42 million. 
dollars and there were six panelists um bed there were really like four that seemed kind of you know for it but we did have two scientists that they had brought and it was really really good and it was not disputed that it is more polluting to run mcneil on wood chips than if we use natural gas so we really, I think we need to shut that down. Um, and that was what I feel came out of the meeting last night. You can go online and they are going to put all the slides. Everything that was on the meeting last night will be up uh, for you to look at. But the scientists had said that wood burning, you know, it generates more greenhouse gases than using the natural gas and we are using chips that you know the excess there were foresters there there were a lot of people in the audience talking but those chips could also be used for insulation and they could also be used in compressed board it doesn't have to be burned that they call it the waste wood from when they're lumbering um, there were several Burlington residents that spoke about the accounting that BED is doing, and they really were, you know, kind of angry because they feel that uh, BED is not being honest with their accounting. And I do hope our counselors will really look into this because we, I think we're being sold this that, oh, it's a great thing for us, but I don't think it is. And in Massachusetts, they have already outlawed burning uh, wood for energy. So anyway, it was a really good, it was from like 6.30 to 9.30 last night. It was a great meeting and there are things on um, the internet that you can look up and see what they said. So thank you. And not to jump the queue, but um, I, I worked for 350 Vermont and this, this thinking about McNeil is one of our our like biggest focuses right now because at scale burning biomass wood wood chips is worse than burning coal or most fossil fuels and so um and that's relatively new science like i think uh, one of the panelists who was a scientist they brought in said like you know to Darren at one point because i was live streaming cuz i couldn't make it down there cuz of work but um said at one point look like what you you know getting McNeil up and running and investing in it made sense 20 years ago and like because that's what science was available but yeah yeah um but like since 2015 there's like a, a ton more data on on the true impacts and the actual emission impacts um but there was one interesting not to take up too much time but one thing i did think was really fair um that i took away from that meeting was like you know if i had my way i'd shut down McNeil tomorrow but um, the reality is it is providing a market to um, loggers and a forestry industry in Vermont. And so I think we do need to start thinking about as a city, you know, it was a little frustrating because I was like, let's get creative. Like we, we literally created that market as a city, <laughs> as, a, as a government. Um, so we have clearly the ability to create a market for um, paying folks to manage their land to capture carbon or you know, thinking of just creative solutions to, you know, one of the things they said for like using it for insulation or using it for different wood products um, was that they're just starting that. Like it's mostly in Europe. I think they said something's opening in Maine, um, some factory. Um, so I don't know. It seems like a very tough problem, but something we got to make sure we're keeping folks whole on. I'll stop ranting. I'll get off my soapbox. So, so Karen, and if someone wanted to watch that video from last night, where would they find it? Somebody was filming it. Okay, so CCTV, CCTV filmed it. And so one way to find it is either on YouTube, but it's a little more difficult. But if you could simply go to, on your computer, cctv.org, and you put in last night's date, which is June, June 13, then everything that CCTV filmed that day will pop up on your screen. So cctv.org, put the date in June 13. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Charlie. Any other um, speak up? I have one question about this project. Is this a, uh, my understanding from what you said, this is not a done deal, 
because I was, it's going to tear up. It's It's not, but I'm afraid that we are getting so invested in it. And certainly the the administration, I feel, is going to support BED because it's jobs. They, They said that last night, it's jobs for them. But again, we have to, we are all in this with the earth and the climate change. I mean, and that was, I felt so impressive last night um, that we can't just ignore this. And yes, the foresters, they need to make money on their wood, but they, they, do you know what they said last night? They get a dollar a ton for wood chips, one dollar. It's because they really sell their wood for the lumber. So they're not making much money on the wood chips. So okay. that- Okay, so that's not my question. I'm sorry. So I understand I understand the thing about the um plant, the wood chip plant. I don't understand the piece about the steam because I was just told they're gonna million, tear up North Street. Right. Forty two million dollars to do a pipeline to transfer the steam from McNeil. They showed a map last night of where it will go. It will actually go on Mansfield, it'll go up North Street. I believe Prospect yep. probably North Street, Mansfield, and up. Yep. And so yes, they did show that. And that center. steam is for electricity and heat for the medical center and yeah. EDM. Yeah, and I would just say, like, to be fair to them, their argument is yes, this is not the greatest from emissions, but we're trying to just invest to make it as efficient as possible. I think on the flip side of that, the only reason that McNeil is economically viable, even if you don't care about climate, and you're just looking at it as looking at it as an energy source is because it gets highly subsidized through renewable energy credits and wood is considered like it is included in that subsidy. Um, however, New York, Massachusetts, and other folks in the region more and more like New York and uh, Massachusetts both don't consider biofuels as they don't include them for subsidies. Um, and so the, one of the people who came up from Massachusetts last night, made the point that, you know, in 10 years, 20 years, we nobody knows for sure, because you can't read the future, but it's very, very possible that um, it won't be included um, in terms of the subsidy from a renewable energy credit. So then we're going to be totally underwater and have spent 42 million for uh, investing in an energy plant that we may not be able to economically operate in anywhere from 10 to 30 years. Anyway, I'm biased. <laughs> you can tell. But um any other things on speak out folks wanted to talk to or speak to rather? Yes, Carol. Oh yeah, Carol. Hi, and I apologize that I'm not there, but <clears throat> Michelle Giles was going to speak during this this time. Is she in the room? Yes, I am. Yeah. Uh... this would be the time, Michelle. Okay, okay, great. So you can tell me next, Carol. Right, right, right. <clears throat> yeah, so my name is Michelle. Um, I'm a graduate student at the University of Vermont, and um, I'm doing a project in Centennial Woods this summer. And um, oh, cool. Yeah, there's a map of Centennial Woods up there. Um, so has ever, have many people visited Centennial Woods? Yeah. Cool. Lots of head nods. Awesome. So you said you say every day. Uh, we should go on a walk sometime. I would love to. <laughs> um, we met in the garden. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Peter and Charlie ended up barging into their garden and, and planting tomatoes with them. Um, they graciously hosted me for about an hour. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, uh, thank you. Thank you, NPA and also um, Old East End Neighborhood Coalition for prompting me to speak tonight but um i have i'm one of the things i'm i one of the goals i have is to improve the accessibility of the trails in centennial woods um i'm specifically interested in um the feasibility of <clears throat> an ada accessible loop so a loop that would be accessible to wheelchairs um strollers mm-hmm. um walkers canes multi multi-use um and uh there's you know, lots that goes into this, but I think community feedback is something that I'm really interested in. Um, and Sam, would you mind just scrolling just a tiny bit down? Okay. Yeah. I put my email on the bottom there. Um, and so you're all each individually invited to email me and 
let me know uh, your thoughts on the trails in Centennial. Um, I'd love to hear more about it, but uh, the the point that I'm thinking for the access uh, is the sort of southwest entrance um, that's off Kerrigan Drive. Uh, yeah, yeah, you're on it. Yeah, <laughs> awesome. Um, and that's like known as the access trail. There's a lot of different names for it. Everybody kind of has their own, but um, because there's parking there, uh, which would be accessible for people. So there's a lot of things going into it, but yeah, I'm, 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 I can take questions about it too. If people have questions right now, that was just sort of like a broad spew of information and thoughts, but, um, and you're also welcome to email me. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> I think it would be interesting for people to know what UVM is thinking about public engagement, what UVM is thinking about public engagement on Centennial Woods. Uh, that was news to me. Yeah. Um, well, there's no, there's no uh, like unified thing behind Centennial Woods and public engagement. The Centennial Woods is, well, 69 acres of it is known as a natural area and natural areas are open to the public and students for recreation and they're supposed to be enjoyed by the public and um, students for recreation and then also um, for like research and studies so that's kind of the goal of a natural area and uh, UVM has nine of them so Centennial Woods is one and it's just local and I think a lot of people maybe go there. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So with a natural area, <clears throat> there's trails already through there. Yeah. And so I, I, you know, Centennial hasn't been left completely wilded. Are those trails um, maintained? And then does the trail maintenance tie into any sort of responsibility to keep people safe? Or is there any sort of like official stance on maintenance and safety anything like that yeah there's sort of a uh um the folks who work for the natural areas kind of cruise the trails from time to time and do like um they can snap photos of of areas of concern and then um there's like grounds management that can come in and and clear certain areas um or there's like you can reach out to forestry sometimes forestry gets involved um, with issues and concerns but there's like nobody whose job it is to walk centennial woods and identify concerns and address them um there's no like single person yeah mm -hmm. can i ask a question yeah hi i'm sharon and hi. um i believe that UVM, although that parcel of land is is involved in the campus, I thought the A Agency of Natural Resources actually managed that. Okay, um, the the land is um, the development rights are owned by the Vermont Land Trust, um, and in fact, they can come by every like five years and inspect that UVM is upholding. Um, what they said they would do, which is mostly that UVM promises not to develop um, the 69 acres that are the natural area. So yeah, they're they're welcome to come by anytime and they can. Um, but to my knowledge, I haven't seen any documents that indicate that they have. So the reason that happened is because the acreage was much larger. It's And Jarrett Wood would have been able to speak to this. It was something like 90 um, acres. 90 acres, well, 90, that, however many acres, but now it shrunk. And um, and some of that was the, the, the feeling from the state that UVM hadn't been good stewards. And so I just wanted to point that out. So I wasn't quite sure um, when you are speaking about this, if you need to inform the land trust or whoever you mentioned uh, about this upgrade? That was my question. Um, there's no, I I mean, I, I would um, inform the Vermont Land Trust, but it falls within the guidelines of what UVM is allowed to do on the land. Um, 
because it's, it falls under like recreation and accessible recreation. There's nothing specific about ADA accessible recreation, but the land is open for recreation and, and any kind of trail improvements are under that kind of category. Um, and then as for the acreage, you're absolutely right. The whole Centennial Woods is 144 acres and 69.1 is the part that's protected by the Vermont Land Trust. Um, and the rest is not protected. It's just um, known as like university property um, with no like specific Vermont Land Trust guidelines that it falls under. That's complex. <laughs> okay. yeah, thank you. Thanks for listening. Thank you. And Michelle, do you care if we share your email out um, on like our wrap up email to everybody? Sweet. Um, any, we're a little, we're eight minutes behind. So any uh, pressing speak out that folks want to sneak in? before we move to city council updates. And I'll, I'll pass it to you. Okay. Consider it passed. Maybe I'll come up and, I think I'm supposed to come up and sit at the table, but you can stand there. Sit. So hi everyone. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, I'm Tim Doherty and I am the uh, city council person for the East District which constitutes wards eight and wards one. Um, and I was elected in March of this year. So uh, thought I would go through some of what, from my perspective, were the highlights of the June 5th city council meeting, um, talk you briefly through my committee work, um, and then address a couple of uh, odds and ends and other things that I've been thinking about and uh, working on. Um, so uh, the, the obviously the big marquee event for the June 5th uh, uh, city council meeting uh, was the vote to confirm Chief Murad. I'm happy to answer questions about that. I don't think I have much more to add to the conversation beyond uh, what I wrote in Front Porch Forum or what I've written to a number of you individually um, or said at the meeting. Uh, the only, uh, I guess, slight uh, additional point that I might add, and it, it and I think it might be somewhat responsive to some of the comments that I've heard, particularly from Richard and Karen, is is that, you know, I, I met extensively with Chief Murad uh, in the weeks, in the two weeks between when the mayor announced that he was going to put him up for the vote um, and on June 5th. And one of the things I asked uh, Chief Murad was whether he would be willing to commit to come uh, to this NPA meeting uh, if the steering committee saw fit to invite him, um, and he uh, promised me that he would. And so if 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 that is something that the committee is interested in doing, um, I will facilitate that, um, and he might be able to address directly some of these issues that you're talking about, particularly with respect to um, uh, traffic enforcement, which is an issue that's near and dear to my heart as well. I have three uh, children uh, on Colonial Square, and uh, it's clear that the city is not enforcing uh, traffic rules, mm -hmm. and we see the effects, even on Colonial Square, we see the effects of people bombing around there, and it makes me uh, apoplectic. Mm -hmm. um, so that invitation is open. Uh, if if you want to speak to Chief Murad, just let me know, and I will facilitate it. Um, the other, uh, and like I said, happy to, happy to take questions about that vote. I know it was contentious, and people had strong feelings about it. Um, another major piece uh, that might have gotten a little bit lost in the shuffle um, of, of the meeting um, was uh, the report from Sarah Russell and others uh, on Burlington's uh, anticipated response to uh, what, what we expect uh, to happen uh, when the funding for the motel uh, voucher program uh, runs out. I really commend everyone. There was a slide deck uh, associated with Sarah's report. Um, I was incredibly impressed uh, by the work that they had done. Um, they had done that in response to a resolution that the city council um, voted on asking them to do that work. Um, I won't do it justice. There's a couple of highlights to it. Um, one is the city's uh, uh, anticipated um, 
and this will require some state approval, um, but um, creation or development of, of another uh, low barrier uh, congregate uh, shelter uh, on Cherry, Cherry Street um, that would house uh, 50 uh, folks. Um, this will be our third, the city's third uh, low barrier uh, shelter that it, that it put in place. Um, another component to the proposed response, none of these things are finalized, but these this was, you know, Sarah uh, 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 talking about uh, the plans, uh, was a 75 uh, person day shelter, so not overnight, but a day shelter uh, for folks experiencing homelessness. Uh, and then continued work and commitment with the CCHA um, to support uh, about 165 folks um, from particularly vulnerable populations um, who they anticipate will be turned out um, when the motel uh, voucher program uh, ends. Now, I read, and I, I know Troy's here, and, and he might be able to help. I, I read this morning quickly. Uh, um, that there was some news that there might be some deal in the works um, that might moot some of this. Um, I have not had the chance to check uh, online and see if there was anything new on Digger uh, since this morning at about 5.30 or 6 when I looked at it. Um, but, but maybe at some point, Troy, you could fill us in on that. Obviously, that would be the best solution um, if, if the state um, found an alternative to doing what I think is a disastrous um, uh, move. Um, so I uh, would love to hear more about that, but that was a big part of, 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 from my perspective, uh, um, the meeting, uh, there was some discussion about, uh, uh, sort of a restructuring of the, uh, debt, uh, that the city's taking on or has already taken on, um, uh, to do, um, the municipal infrastructure component, uh, of the city place, uh, development. Uh, I thought that was interesting and commend people to that. I confess that I am still um, learning the details of that incredibly complicated uh, financial structure, um, but Tim Sampson um, came and I thought he gave a good presentation. Um, it was the second time I heard his presentation and I understood more of it the second time than I did the first time. Um, so uh, I commend people to that. Those were the highlights from uh, the June city council meeting. Um, as Sharon pointed out, looking forward, um, our next major task is to approve uh, the budget. Um, I was able to uh, attend almost all of the um, anticipatory um, budget meetings in which we heard from the various departments on their budgetary needs um, and proposals going forward. I think I told you the last time that I was here uh, that what the administration in a, in a sort of high level overview tells us is, is that they are anticipating some lean uh, budget years going forward um, as a result largely of the um, trickling down of federal money that, that has contributed so greatly to our budget picture over uh, the last couple of years. Um, for whatever it's worth, I, I really share these concerns uh, that Sharon raised and I think that Karen raised um, about the tax burden um, that Burlingtonians are, are um, experiencing right now, um, both renters and property owners alike. I have been struck as a brand newbie uh, city council person uh, how little discussion I've seen so far devoted when we're talking about issues of public policy, whether it's oversight of, of the police department or other aspects of public policy, when we're discussing adding components to city government, uh, how little discussion uh, if any, uh, I've heard so far devoted to the discussion of how we are going to fund these projects that um, have merit um, on their own, but can't be considered uh, without thinking about um, the tax burden on Burlington taxpayers um, and renters uh, who, of course, share that burden. So uh, definitely something I'm going to be paying attention to as I go into my first vote on the budget. Uh, committees. Uh, I'm on the Public Safety Committee. Uh, we have not had a meeting since I last uh, met with you. Um, I am also on the Joint Ordinance and Charter Change uh, Committee. It's a bit of a mouthful, the name of the committee. It's important because that is the committee that currently is addressing uh, its special committee. Uh, that's the, the committee that is currently addressing the question of police oversight. We have had a meeting since I last spoke with you. 
Um, Stephanie Seguino um, from the police commission presented at that meeting, um, provided her perspective and the police commission's perspective uh, on the question of police oversight, uh, which I found to be tremendously helpful. I'm also on the tax abatement committee, um, probably the least uh, exciting uh, of the committees, although I'm kind of into it as a lawyer. Um, we didn't do anything uh, at the tax abatement committee meeting except uh, hear from the city attorney's office um, who gave everybody uh, on the committee a primer and a primer on the role of that committee. So that is my committee work for the last month. That is my overview of the uh, um, most recent city council meeting. Um, other things, uh, I guess the principal thing is, I don't know uh, if any of you saw, there was some uh, there was some reporting on uh, the, in which Bill Ward was quoted um, on the question of, of trash and trash removal uh, and fines associated uh, uh, with that. This is something that I've been hearing a lot about um, from constituents, some of you, some of whom are here, um, but many of whom are not. Um, and I've been in communication with Bill Ward and intend to continue to work with him. I don't have a specific proposal um, to articulate for you right now, but I am working on it um, because it's a real quality of life, health, uh, and public safety, I think, issue um, that we continue to have uh, an incredible amount of trash in our greenways. Um, but my children uh, have all gone to IAA in Ward 2. Um, I regularly walk down there to this day with my eight-year-old, you know, and essentially we, you know, you wade through trash to get to IAA. Um, it's not acceptable. It's hard for me to believe that we can't do it a, a much, much better job. I do say that with some humility because I know many people have been working on this for years and years and, and, and I don't uh, pretend to be able to swoop in and solve it, but it's a priority of mine. Um, and I hope to have more re to report to you when we meet back again in September on that front. So that's my report, but I'd be happy to answer questions to the best of my ability. Yes, you want to call on people. Yeah. <laughs> A housing question. I know you're thinking about the building that was the used to be Y on the corner of North Union and College. Yes. And I've heard that someone is privately owned by some of the defense attorneys in Fort Hotel. Yes. And I'm just wondering if you or anyone in the field actually knows, you know, it's so many square feet. Um, I don't know what the condition is inside of this fort, but I'm wondering if it's being considered for any kind of I was it is. Um, thanks. And I did attend a meeting. And I'm trying to remember what meeting it was. Ward 8. It was the Ward 8. Thank you. It was the Ward 8 NPA meeting um, in which there was a presentation. I got there late um, and missed most of it. But it was a, it was not a presentation by the owner, but it was a presentation by a local developer, developer who's working with the owner. Um, they did have some... Uh, um, design plans there, um, and the discussion was the intent to uh, make an apartment building uh, there that would require considerable renovation, um, but that is a plan that is in the works. Um, I don't, they did talk about square footage, and I apologize, I don't, I don't know um, what that, what the real presentation was, but I can get that for you, um, because I think it was, I think it was publicly yeah, and you don't remember like how many apartments would be in the I don't. It was a lot. Great. It was a lot. Well, yeah, it it, it sounded it it did the, the piece that I heard sounded great. You know, there were people in the neighborhood who raised concerns um too, like it like everything else. Um, you know, how high it was gonna be, whether it was gonna, you know, block residents' lights, you know, like with anything else, there are there are pluses and minuses. So I, it's not that I have I don't I don't have an opinion right now on whether it's the right kind of development and I you know I'm not being asked I don't think the city council's anywhere close to being a place where we'd be asked to weigh in. Generally speaking, the more housing we can build, the better, in my view. And so on that though, there's one other bonus right here on the board, and I'm curious to know if anyone knows about um, um, the 
Bobby Christie School, the housing where the nuns live for all those years and next now. The Sisters of Mercy. This is Bobby Christie School. In front of that prison as well as the other. I'm just I I know curious to know about it. So my understanding is that Monte Cristi bought that building and is expanding into the building, but the land is still Sisters of Mercy land, the land that goes all the way through there. That's kind of building. They're expanding their programs in the school. Yeah. That's what I heard as well. Not an official capacity. I just heard the, the building that yeah. closes to the fire station. Yeah. And then there's a building that connects to the Sisters of Mercy building. That's their middle school. And that's what's being expanded. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I think Carter's. Do we decide who's calling? I, I don't know, but you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for uh, being, you know, the track saying that you're taking it seriously because we've been asking for this for years and years. Yeah, and I do it with humility, right? Like I realize that you and and many others um, have been working on this and pushing Bill and pushing others within city government, and I don't mean to come in and say that. I'm going to be able to solve this problem, but you know, Zariah had a really good idea um, about <laughs> it relates to par parking enforcement. She said, "Well, why can't we have? Why can't we designate within you know, you know, a certain certain time, like when the students are leaving, some of the, the parking enforcement people to do trash enforcement?" I thought that was a great idea. I don't know whether it's feasible. You know, what I am thinking about is is a gradated uh, um, fine process. Um, but I'd like it to be combined with some other things. And frankly, I'd like to get some commitment from UVM on this. You know, UVM is making overtures about wanting to be a better partner or being perceived as a better partner. Uh, you know, what a great opportunity. Um, and so, you know, I'd like, I'd like to explore that as well. Um, why shouldn't we have, you know, a massive, you know, why shouldn't we devote some funding uh, and some energy toward you know, blanketing these landlords who profit so well uh, from renting uh, in our name, mostly in the East District, or uh, and really sort of, you know, you know, they should be getting flyers, they should be getting emails, they should be getting bulletins. These are what the fines are going to be. We're going to hold you accountable. You know, then they should be passing that along to their renters. You know, and they hold the security deposits over them, and we should push the burden on this. You know, I don't want to constantly talk about being a lawyer, but like there's a sort of theory of tort law, right? Which is that, the, you know, the person who is in the best place to avoid the harm, the most efficient cost avoider should pay. And who's the most efficient cost avoider in all this garbage? It's the landlords. And so I will, I, I, it's a priority for me. Thanks. I do have a question about the tip that came up, the tip funding. So it's a huge document, and I'm sure many of the counselors didn't read it. Um, because, and it was called a uh, addendum. I mean, it's just- Yeah, it, I have it right here. Yep. Oh, you have it, it's like, it's big. right? Yeah, it's, okay. it's big. Okay. Yep. Anyway, but it does, my gist of it is that the city and CPP, the city play partners. Yep. Have missed the tip deadline, and the project lacks financing, and so the city, so they are not going to be able to keep building and meet the deadline. I think it's the end of this month. The the partners, okay. So the city, and this is words out of this. It says the city will issue interim tip debt of eighteen million eight hundred and forty. <laughs> to circumvent deadline and preserve the, the tip dollars. City, so when I said this at the meeting, I went to the council meeting, and Moreau didn't directly say it to me, but he's saying this, that the city, and I'm saying this, the city insists this is not a loan, but it does say in that whole document that DCP will pay the city tip borrowing costs. Because so we, we are borrowing money to 
put in this to help out the builders. I mean, again, I think we're backed in a hole, just like we were back. We're, I think we're backing ourselves in a hole with this McNeil thing because we want, everybody wants something in that pit, but we are <laughs> bending over backwards. Like this is the best borrowing deal anyone could ever get what these guys are getting, what the city is giving them. So anyway, I just think that, I mean, you probably understand it way more than I do, but it is a loan. I mean, we should just admit it. We are borrowing money to help them out because they didn't make the deadline. And we want the building to keep going on, which I do too. But I think we should just say that, yes, we are going to risk, and we don't even know, they said it's a meeting. They don't know yet what they're building in the North Tower. So how do we know what we build will pay back the TIF money we are borrowing? You know what I mean? Like, that's what gets me. And they are putting a hotel now. They did say it's not all housing. There's going to be a hotel. So we don't want a hotel. We want housing. So anyway, I hate TIF. I feel like just like Massachusetts and New York has outlawed the fossil, you know, the burning of wood for energy. Many, many states have outlawed TIF funding because it is so bad for the education fund. That's We're taking education dollars and giving it, we're financing it for these buildings. So anyway, I'm upset about that because I feel like they're dancing around and they're not admitting. And, you know, it's the administration that we are, it is a loan. If there, it states in there, they're going to pay the fees that we are going to pay because we're borrowing money. So anyway, it's a lot, it's a lot, but I do feel like we are foolish to risk all this money for this development that can't get financing. And now they're saying that in the North Tower, they don't know what they'll put there. And there is going to be a hotel. And I, I want to- And we're not going to have the part one benefit for us, which is supposed to be, a, you know, an observation deck. That was going to be the city's benefit with this whole thing. We're not going to have that now. I want to let Tim respond, um, but we are, we're late. Um, and I do want to make sure that Gary and um, Akilis have time to speak and then we can get to Troy as well. But um, yeah, last thoughts. So, so um, th th there was there was a lot there. Um, and, and I am trying to get up to speed on the structure. Um, it's not my area of the law and it is complicated and there is a long history. Um, I, I think I can respond to at least one aspect of your concern um, with the caveat that I could be mistaken or misunderstood. My understanding is the $18 million is to pay for city infrastructure associated with the development. It is not, I do, I do not understand it to be a loan to the developers. I understand right. it to be money that we've, by the way, already committed to having borrowed um, that we are going to pay so that this, this, the folks who are building the stuff are also going to be building streets that are go with it. They are also going to be building the sewers that go underneath the street. They are going to be building, right? the infrastructure, the city infrastructure that in the ordinary course, the city would just pay for. Um, but they are going to be building that stuff. They are going to be incurring costs and that we are going to have to pay them once they incur the cost. And my understanding of what, what happened or what's happening is that it is true that they haven't met financing benchmarks that were part of the original structure. I also understand, and this is based upon what the attorney explained, that that's very, very common. Um, and that as a result, we have changed the way we are structuring this debt to give us more protection. But in, in other words, it's interim debt rather than sort of a block debt. Um, that's my understanding of that. So I don't think I don't think it's true that we are lending the city place developers $18 million in this instance. With respect to your other concerns, I, I hear you. Um, unless we have any burning desires, I'm going to go to Gary um, for school school board updates. 
Oh, you might be frozen though, Gary. Hi, everyone. Um, oh, now, now we got you. Okay, not sure <clears throat> which end it's on. Um, so, uh, pretty quick uh, update. It hasn't been a slow time. It's just a lot of what's going on is executive session that I can't share with you. Um, we, uh, the deconstruction at, uh, on Institute Road is moving along. Um, building A, which was the auditorium and the gym is pretty much gone. Um, the material's still there. It has to be sorted based on the PCB levels to determine where the waste will be sent. Um, my understanding there aren't any sites in Vermont where it can end up uh, because we're really only down to, I think, the one landfill uh, up near Newport, and it would not take the PCB heavy material. So that, <clears throat> if you see it piling up, it's just because it has to be tested, it has to be sorted. Um, but it's moving along. We're still looking at Christmas 2025 as the changeover from um, the downtown BHS to the new building. Sorry, Sam, you're going to be gone by then, I think. <laughs> or you may have one last semester there. Um, and on that note, uh, I, I know Sam's sad, but tomorrow at noon, uh, the schools will, will be out for the summer. Um, so that's on the side. Um, <laughs> sorry Sam's to change Sam. Sad. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. The other part is we're slightly struggling to find administrators. Um, I think it's sort of a sign of times that um, administrator and teachers, but particularly administrators, um, it's become a very difficult position to be in. Um, you've never really made people happy being an administrator, but now it's impossible. <laughs> and the levels of, um, yeah, it's just the behavior they're seeing, um, which has valid sources, but um, it's, it's a difficult time. So we have openings, um, both middle school principal uh, positions are open and we're why net has been cast again to try to, to fill those positions over the summer. Um, so likely at this point we have the, those two spots open um, and Tom is working hard to fill those. Um, so I want to give you give by a chance. I'll. Um, I did have a. Um, I was this month's article in the um, North Avenue News or North End News, so you can read a little bit of what I've been up to this last month uh, there, and then I'll do an update uh, this week. So uh, please, any questions? Any questions going once, going twice? No, I'm not seeing any, Gary. I think you're good. Oh, great. All right. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Um, getting back to my agenda here. Um, I think we're going to turn it over to Troy and Brian, if you want to come up to the table yes. um, to talk about legislative updates. Senior representative is going to pick things off. So um, we're going to give you an update, I think, on, on the budget. And I'm going to talk about many strengths of the budget and then hand it over to Troy to talk about um, a very costly error in the budget that we're hoping to fix. So <clears throat> and I'm going to refer to my front porch forum post and set a timer for myself just to try to stay on track. So how, how do we have 10 minutes total? Uh, yes. Or has our has our appropriation been cut down to like seven minutes? Like the time? Yeah, what is the time. what is the comp? Well, we'll do five minutes for me, five minutes for you, and maybe minutes. I'll do four minutes, and you and then you can do as long as you want. I'm not managing it, All right? So, um, yeah. So, um, okay. Well, hopefully you can hear me online. Um, so I pulling up my notes. So, um, the 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 budget 
has $8.4 billion in spending in it. And the, this spending invests in a mix, it invests a mix of state and federal dollars in a wide array of services and programs that impact or impact all sectors of the economy and people from all walks of life in Vermont. Um, but what is the true cost of this, these policy and spending decisions? Um, true cost accounting is an approach to accounting where you look at not only the economic costs, but you look at the environmental and social costs. And too often in our society, we don't do that. So when you look at um, the true cost of climate change, for example, it's unpredictable, but the cost of inaction has been immense. There were mixed feelings about the Affordable Heat Act. Um, and I also have mixed feelings because although it takes an important step towards addressing um, global warming, it doesn't take into account the full economic and social costs of energy um, when it's produced as a profitable commodity in a global extractive economy. So as we create regulations to control gaseous waste, we need to keep working on how we reduce other wastes and other harm caused by energy production. And we should be maximizing the efficiency of in infrastructure, especially our new infrastructure. And we need to move quickly towards localized sustainable energy production. Um, that we're making historic investments that increase access to child care alongside improvements to unemployment and workers' compensation benefits. And um, the long-term financial savings that will come from these investments in child care are immense because of the social determinants of health. Uh, the cost to the individual, in my opinion, outweighs, um, it, it justifies the long-term um, pub public health benefits. For example, uh, the best I could get was the 2021 Burlington median income because of the way data is updated. It was $34,054 in 2021 dollars. Uh, for a person making that much, they would pay $12.50 more a month out, out of their income tax. And if they're self-employed, they would only pay $3 more per month. And that additional expense from everyone allows all families sliding scale access to childcare in a, in a better sustained system. So to me, that was a worthy investment that I stand by. Um, the house, I'm just gonna check my timer. Okay, I'm doing good. I got one minute and 33 seconds. So the House Healthcare Committee advocated for major changes to pol or adjustments to policy and spending to uh, assist our healthcare system after we um, we've had years of neglect and um, and uh, decades of neglect and years of stress from the pandemic. So we are increasing provider rates. For example, um, DA, the designated agencies and specialized service agencies are getting 5%. Primary care providers are getting 10%. But we're also increasing rates for federally qualified health centers, dental providers, EMS, recovery centers, nursing homes, youth service providers, and more. And these rates are barely keeping up with inflation, but at least we're giving providers these rates after three years of, inflation, of major inflation. Um, the healthcare committee also is increasing access to more mental health treatment, um, more beds in inpatient and residential care, mobile crisis expansion around the state and peer support services are rolling out. We're continuing incentives for recruitment and retention of health and human services workers. Ex we expanded efforts to prevent death by suicide, firearms and overdose at a time when we have record level suicide and record level overdoses. And we're promoting health equity and addressing disparities through funding of the Health Equity Advisory Commission. Um, and then, although access to clinical health care is an important social determinant of health, it only has 20% impact on health outcomes, while other social determinants like education, employment, poverty have a 50% impact. So we, if an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, then we need to be consciously thinking about how to reinvest money over time into those social determinants of health because the long-term savings um, outweigh the, the cost. Um, and so speaking of the social determinants of health, one major area that we worked on this, this session was housing and another is, is um, incarceration. I don't know what you plan to speak to, but I thought those might be two, so you would. Housing, all right, so I'm well, gonna hand it over to Troy. I'll, I'm gonna do, just kind of do the, the, the big picture of, of where the budget is right now, right? So the budget passed the House, the budget passed the Senate um, and was vetoed by the governor. Um, it has a veto proof, it, it had veto proof support in the Senate. It did not have veto proof in, uh, uh, in, in, the, in the House. Uh, the five progressives, Brian and I, uh, along with the three other progressives, along with 12 Democrats, mm -hmm. voted no on the budget. And we voted no on the budget because we did not think it did um, all that it could have, especially with regard to the sudden impact it was going to have on the 2,800 some plus people um, who were housed by the, the voucher program, the hotel voucher program. Um, so we all um, we spent some time in that in those fine in that final debate talking about why we could not support the budget as it was written, 
um, with the absence of any support uh, for for the folks who are about to get uh, mass evicted. Uh, that has already started. Uh, uh, the first group of people who were evicted uh, happened on June 1st. There were five, maybe six hotels um, where the owner of the hotels um, gave a grace period, a two-week grace period. Uh, that ends tomorrow, so the 15th. Um, I think the number is close to three or 400 more people uh, will be evicted. Um, the anticipation of many of those people arriving to Burlington is that we'll definitely notice. Um, and then the next set of evictions is scheduled for July 1st. Um, since the the House um, left session, um, the 17 of us who voted now have been meeting regularly, once, um, twice a week. Um, and um, that number kind of might have, we may have attracted more. Um, it, it may be as high as 25 of us. Um, we have written a policy um, so to, to, to solve this problem. Um, and we can do this. There are a few ways that this could resolve itself. Um, I think the best way is that we create a policy that funds the continued housing for the folks who are in the hotel voucher program and um, gives them a much smoother off-ramp into the services that the budget that Brian was just talking about does provide um, for folks who are needing shelter. Um, that has been written, that has been delivered to house leadership. Um, it is there's a group of three folks who are negotiating with House leadership as to how much of that um, they would be willing to consider. It's a policy. It's not it's not reopening the budget. Um, and in the meantime, uh, so the Joint Fiscal Committee is a group of uh, folks from the House and the Senate who continue to meet um, even when we're not in session. Uh, they have been putting their heads together and are presenting uh, their own proposal to the governor and the administration about how they're essentially doing a bit of an about face. I think that's how Vermont Digger um, caused um, um, what Vermont Digger called it. And they have realized that this is too abrupt. Um, I think they also realize that there are at least 17 of us who are, are not willing to to override the veto until uh, this gets fixed. Um, so the handwriting is on the wall for them. Um, th there's a lot to be optimistic about. Um, we haven't seen the details of their proposal yet. I've been checking my notes because that me that group of us is meeting, you know, as we're meeting. Um, um, and I think I did see an update um, about how their proposal differed from ours, but I hesitate to say this because I haven't seen it myself. Um, this is what's in the rolling notes. What what we can tell is different between the House leadership position and our primary position is that their their position doesn't doesn't do anything about state land use yet. So, you know, we were handing people uh, tents and sleeping bags and then it would have been illegal for them to use it on any state lands. Um, not a lot of details on the Joint Fiscal Committee oversight, meaning how are they going to hold the administration's feet to the fire? Um, not a lot of details on reworking the request for proposals for if we do continue to use motels, um, bargaining a better rate, um, and then where the money is coming from. I can talk a lot about where the money would come from, from our proposal, because a lot of it, um, we targeted the Capitol bill and I served on the institutions and Com corrections committee, which is all about the Capitol bill. Um, the governor in his signing of the Capitol bill just today, um, <laughs> um, brought that into the conversation. Um, he is, um, I, I can talk for a long time about what I think the governor did with $60 million of surplus funds so that we wouldn't use it for this sort of rainy day, right, um, emergency. Long story short, um, leadership in the House, leadership in the Senate are working towards a solution. We don't know the details of their proposal yet. Um, we have a proposal ready to go, um, and I think we have support for that proposal. Um, that's that's the best option, is if one of those proposals uh, works to keep people housed. Um, if it doesn't, um, it is not the doomsday scenario that is being portrayed in the in the media. If we decide to sustain the veto of the budget, we will have another budget ready to go. Um, and it'll take a few days, um, but 
that's option number two is to sustain the veto and give them a new budget to work with. That includes money for the folks who need housing. Um, option three, I suppose, would be leadership could just play ball with um, the administration and bypass us all together. I don't think that's going to happen. What do you think today? That's good. I think all I would say is that we've spent a massive amount of money keeping people sheltered um, during the pandemic and throwing people out wait, wastes the money because people, when the trauma of that eviction is going to be costly on those other social determinants of health and on our neighborhoods as they de as crime increases, as quality of life decreases, um, and that we're this close, like that we're, we're, yeah. we're, this is one of the biggest building booms in history. We have hundreds of units going on. The estimates are 100 to 200 people a month from hotels will be placed over the next year. That's half. All we need to do is step it up a little and come in, come up with some interim options, maybe buy a few hotels instead of renting them, make them into shelters and then convert them into buildings. I wrote an op-ed about this that I, I'm going to include in my front porch forum post tomorrow because it's all about housing because it was like a lot. Um, it talks a lot about the numbers of the investments and it has that op-ed that talks about all the things we can be doing. And so I think the main thing is we're asking for to guarantee shelter and to and for the state to create a just transition from this this program to housing for all. And if Vermont does this right, we could end homelessness as we know it moving forward. I mean, we're that close. And so this is a high stake situation. That's but I just wanted to say that, you know, that it's that's where I'm at. Oops. That this is not only the financially res responsible thing to do, it's the socially responsible thing to do, and it's the moral thing to do. And I think there's plenty of reason to be optimistic. I think the movement we've seen in leadership over the past week uh, is encouraging. We just don't know the details yet. Do people have any questions for us? Thank you so much. Thanks. Yeah. Um, if you can, I would thank the, especially, I mean, everybody expects this from the progressives, right? Um, we're the ones who are gonna do this. Um, the 12 Democrats um, who stood on the floor and said no to that budget and balked leadership and balked their speaker um, have been facing a lot of pressure from that leadership. So if you have an opportunity to reach out to the folks and thank them, um, that would be a kind thing to do, I think. I had it at one point. Um, I, I can I can I can maybe put that out to front porch forum. And if you really can't wait, you can always go on the state website and look at the roll call for the yeah. budget vote. Yeah. Uh, H-494 is was the bill number. If I mean, like, if you went on your phone now, if you don't want to wait, you could find, look through all the yeses and nos, but it sounds like Troy will also follow up. Yeah. But just so the public knows out there, you know, you can look at our roll calls and everything at the legislative website. It's actually quite detailed. I might have it on my phone. Thank you, Dave. And I do want to say sorry to anyone who's emailed me at, and asked for something and not heard back. I have a system where if you ask, I try to respond. But if you just say, please vote a certain way, I just look at it and I keep going because I get hundreds of emails. So if anyone's been waiting for an email, it's always okay to ask again. But I try to be good about if someone asks to at least catch you, but I probably missed some. So I just want everyone to know, don't give up, try again. And that if you if you didn't get a response, it's simply the volume and the pre like the pressure. And I'm also a provider working with unhoused people, so it's been like hellish what I'm seeing. And I'm happy to talk more about that with you two another time. So, oh yes, other folks. Yeah, thank you very much for your work. And it sounds like it's all going in the right direction. Um, one of the things, and this may be back to the city council rather than the legislators, but when. I'm still here. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> there was conversation about, uh, and this was this was back with the resolution that had Sarah Russell do the work that she did, I yeah. think. Um, but it was about trying to find regional solutions rather than a yeah. city solution. Now, I understand that if the state is going to put money into this, it's regional, it's the state. But has there been any work um, so that the burden doesn't fall unduly on the city of Burlington, where this really is a bigger a bigger issue than the city of Burlington. And and is and is that where this I mean you you said something that would represent something like 2000 units in the next year being created said, 100 to 200 a month. Um so is that in Burlington is that the statewide, statewide? It's statewide and there and are how many would how many would we get of those? That I'd have to do my homework. I know that there's hundreds alone for downtown development that'll be available in 2024 I think. 
So, I mean, there's there's a massive housing boom happening right now all over Chittenden County. If you drive around, you see buildings popping up in towns. Just as, as, as for the response statewide, it's varying region to region. Like the city of Burlington and Chittenden County folks have done a great job to mobilize at the last minute. It's, it's like very commendable what the city is doing at this point and the region. Other regions, not so much. Some places have not, nothing in place. Others like in, in the Washington County um, or in Brattleboro, they're like, they're also like creating regional. So everyone's not going to end up here, but there are a lot of people will end up here because we're in the County and we're, and, and, you know, we attract people from all over the state. If you go to homeless encampments in Burlington and you ask where people come from, they're not from out of state. Every now and then I meet a trans, like a, a LGBTQI refugee who came here thinking they were safe and then were kicked out of the hotel or offered a bus ticket back to Texas or something, which is like, and they ran, they fled in fear every now and then. But most of them come from Barry, from 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 um, Franklin County, from rural areas where there was there was not a place to safely camp, so they come to Burlington. So, for what it's worth, different regions are doing a different response, but it's pro it's not equal, and we may get people because it's failing. That being said, I want. Now that I spoke about the state piece, I don't know if our city councilor wants to say anything about the local response. Well, well I, I, I'm you might have to come up to the mic, though. I'll do this. I don't come up. Um, you know, I'm happy to hear you, Brian, compliment the city of Burlington on its response. And, and you know, just to expound a little bit on, on what Jonathan said and maybe to put a little bit of a sharper point on it. Um, you know, the Burlington has taken a disproportionate share of this burden has and is you know we have in the last few years the city of burlington has stood up to low barrier shelters and is you know planning to if necessary to stand up a third you know Elm, elmwood avenue is it you know runs a cost of of you know about 1.1 million dollars uh, a year um the champlain valley inn i think is close to that i think it's less than a million dollars um, you know, I understand that there's federal money um, and perhaps some state money there. Um, but, you know, those are those are significant policy commitments that embody, I think, the values of this city. Um, and that I think the administration, the city council and Burlington citizens should be rightly proud of. Is it enough to to address this overwhelming problem? No, c clearly not. I was struck, though, during Sarah Russell's presentation that that at least from her, from her understanding at the time, that, that no other municipality in Chittenden County um, has, at least to my knowledge or to her knowledge, come forward and said, we're going to stand up a low barrier shelter. And, you know, I am curious as to whether or not there are some levers. Uh, obviously, if this is going in the direction and I, too, am heartened by what you say. If this is going in this direction, then this would be the best possible solution. But, you know, I, I am curious as to whether there are any levers that can be pulled in Montpelier to pressure other municipalities in Chittenden County besides Burlington to stand up low barrier shelters and provide some of these services. Um, you know, because as we all know, we live in we the city has limited resources, just like like any other um, government. And, you know, that's important to recognize. To put a finer point on it, what can the legislature do to encourage, browbeat, shame, uh, you know, other municipalities in Chittenden County to do their fair share in response to this humanitarian crisis? So I won't speak to what we can do to shame or anything like that because that's not my style but i think we can incentivize we can incentivize it maybe through um through tax breaks for municipalities who choose to be sanctuary communities or whatever welcoming communities whatever we want to designate the name to be we could offer extra money to places and there's definitely this is the these are the kinds of solutions we need time like to figure out before we dump people to the streets and then where do they end up so we're hoping to buy some time to keep people in those hotels for the state to start reinvesting that money. And maybe part of that reinvestment is looking at where the hotels are instead of moving people, trying to buy the hotels. One idea I had was what if in what if 
these there's some hotels who the area around them have been harmed over time from um, the crime. So the people in the neighborhoods are angry at the hotels. There's all this like there's been harm caused by the actions of the state. What if the state said we're going to bring the people in the hotels and the people outside of the hotels and the business owners and the landlords together in that neighborhood now? and dream of what that neighborhood could be. And then we dump money into revitalizing that neighborhood, public-private partnership, building housing in that neighborhood. And then the people who live in the hotels just move into that housing because now they're neighbors with the other people because they created a community together in the wake of this harm. Like we can do that as a state. And there are pieces of legislation in place right now that are leading us there. But I do think we need to like, it needs to be swifter and there, there needs to be grants, incentives, funding, focused on these kinds of revitalization efforts. And that might, to some of the municipalities outside of Burlington, entice people to say, okay, there's all this money if we revitalize this neighborhood around the hotel and that could be a place where housing's built. So that's one way I would suggest. Um, that's just one idea. I could go on and on because I can keep thinking of ideas. But I mean, and we all pay attention over the next, I, I, I would say week, um, if not sooner, uh, uh, whatever proposal comes forward, either from the leadership or from the proposal of this group of 17, um, at what it requires the administration to do, because we can we can legislate that the administration is responsible for um, spending that money, um, you know, equitably across the state. Um, so I, I don't know if that's in the proposal that's currently being drafted by leadership by the Joint Fiscal Committee or not, but um, watch for that because... I, I think we have to do a much better job. The legislature has to do a much better job of putting those guardrails guardrail, of expectation in place for the administration. Clearly, they weren't there. Um, we weren't ready. And I think we got to move on from there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Cheryl for, we'll do 10 minutes on graffiti update and then, um, yeah, and then we'll talk beautification and MPA projects. Hi. <laughs> um, so I've prepared a presentation. It includes 12 photos and coordinated with Sam. So I have a little intro and then here's the first one. So um, some attribute the start of graffiti with the first cave art drawings. Ancient Greeks and Romans signed public building walls, sometimes including poems. American soldiers in World War II wrote the phrase, Kilroy was here. And it was accompanied by a sketch of a man peeking over a ledge as a way to encourage soldiers coming along the same route after them. And then in 1949, the invention of the aerosol spray paint in cans made it affordable. And now I'm gonna take you into Burlington 2023. So this first photo is the backside of Memorial Auditorium. And this is what's called basic graffiti tagging. So it's your signature, or it could be a nickname that you use. Um, and you can see that there's some tagging that's been done over other tagging there. Um, there it is. Okay, next one. So I bet you've all seen this one. And can we zoom in at all, Sam, or is that not quite possible? Okay, that's fine, thanks. Yeah, great, great. So can you go over to, so we can see matter, the word matter? Okay, so this is what I would call a little bit of respectful <laughs> tagging. You can see on the T, someone has tagged right there and then a little bit on the top of the flower on the end. But it's it's clear that there is some respect for this mural. Um, maybe this is a way of wanting to identify with the message, Black Lives Matter. I'm not sure. Um, it's the only mural that I've seen that I know of that's been tagged directly like that. Okay. And then we're going to 
go up high. And this graffiti art photo was taken outside the main entrance of City Market downtown. And if you look up on the far left, yep, right about there, um, you can see the word mother that's been written in um, brick and paint combination. So a friend said, as we were looking at it together just before I took the photo, you know, this is really interesting to look at. And so the more formal graffiti art tagging um, here compared to what we see at the street level, if we back off now a little bit, yeah, so you see that tagging that's happening there at the street level around the parking area. And that's back to just the, you know, um, just the name tagging itself, okay, with not much else involved. Um, you can see, too, that there are fences being put up. Maybe you've noticed that. This is the building I was asking you, and Tim reported that he knew about some developer who's working to move this into housing. But this is the... Um, old YMCA building from the back. It's the one um, on Union and College, and it's been deserted for quite a long time. And also, um, you can see that the fire escapes, I don't know, I, I mean, I would love to camp out and just observe what happens when that painting is done, how people are getting there, um, how they stay alive. Okay. okay. And then the next one, okay. So um, there it is in big bold letters on this beautiful mural, um, rest in paint. <laughs> and up, you'll also see over on the side, um, it it says, in memory of Mike. And then up in the top right is the signature of the group of graffiti artists known as Above the Radar. Has anybody heard of them before? Yeah, interesting. Okay. Son -in -law. What? It's my son-in-law that um, runs that wow. art okay. festival every year. Beautiful. They, they bring artists from all over. Yeah, so yeah. I, like this, not exactly. Not so I'm gonna place. I'm gonna talk about that too. So um, this huge mural, we'll see a little more of it, was commissioned by the Lake Champlain Transportation Company, and it is by the ferry dock, but you only see it if you walk down toward the lake and then turn back because this mural wall actually faces the lake itself. Um, and so here are a couple more slides of it. So continuing along the wall, there's another mix of signatures and then a figure against the um, orange there. A lot of brilliant colors. It's, um, and you know, when the light changes on it, pretty interesting. Okay, and then the third one from this mural is the end of the building. And if we could, um, again, more artful tagging, but if we could get into the enlarging the right hand half, a couple of things I want to say. Okay, so um, <clears throat> first of all, take a look at the giraffes. So I stood there just in awe kind of. So those giraffes are painted on the wall surface itself. And then there's a couple of indents and a little over, not an overhang, but it, it dents and up there. So the giraffes were painted. I don't know which end they started at, but you know, they, they move all along that. I would have loved to have been there to see that. Um, you see, you see the giraffes? No, just now. Zebras. Zebras are oh, I'm sorry. Of course they're zebras. <laughs> oh my goodness. Of course they're zebras. And you know what? It says it does say zebra in my note. I just should pay attention. Okay. 
And there are a couple more messages in this. So right, you see that cross um, wood, wooden pole that's there next to the kind of little fanged creature in blue. There are two quotes. And the first one says, tell your friends you love them. And below that, the second one says, time does not heal all wounds. And then on the right is the painted on poster of this group called um, Above the Radar. And up at the top, it says, Ant Hill Bros. And then the second line says, Burnham Daily. Okay. So anyway, it continues on and goes a little bit around a corner. I think you'd enjoy going to see it. So, okay, next slide. We're gonna go down to Main Street. Okay, and can we zoom in a little? Yeah. So this is right next door to Nectar's. And the word is that Nectar's did indeed um, work with these mural artists too, um, which I was, would say are graffiti artists. And it, so what I learned is that a group of Burlington artists painted this with under the auspices of um, Nectar's. So this first one is a tribute to Andy A. Dog Williams, who you may know, he was a beloved DJ and musician and he <laughs> passed away at age 38 in 2013. And then mm -hmm. if we and then if we go to the next slide. And down in the corner in pink, it says, thank you, A Dog, for paving the way. And that energy is coming from this figure. And then we're gonna go across the street in that alley. And here's the horse. And one more moving forward. So this is what you see at the edge of the alley as you're walking down Main Street, if you choose to walk in, if you're walking down toward Memorial Auditorium, for example. And um, it's the signed peace sign, right? So, Kyle Holbrook has written his name up there. It's very easy to read. And then it says, peace in quotes, and then stop guns, exclamation point, 2021. And then what was so interesting to me too, is that if you look at the wall to the right of that, that's not really part of the mural, although it is painted red, um, there's a lot of tagging. So my hunch is that after the mural was made, that respectful tagging happened on the end of it as a way of kind of confirming support for it or whatever. Okay, two more slides. We've got about five minutes. Okay. So here's George Floyd. And this is at the on Lakeside Avenue. It's just on the wall that's between the turn in to Hula and um, St. John's Club parking lot right there on the right. And every time I ride my bike by, I just stop to look and take a moment. Um, I think it's been there for nearly three years. I think it's an example of very simple lines um, really convey a, a tribute message. And then right next to that, <clears throat> is this on a breaker box. And I think that's all that I want to say about it. Oh, no, there was one more thing, sorry. Um, so my hunch about this is that no one asked permission to paint George Floyd's image here three times. And I believe this to be Hula Group property. Um, and that Hula has respected the importance of the of this mural. Um, and so there you have it. I have a few more comments to make. 
<clears throat> so I am have been in pursuit since the last time we met, which is where this began, um, of answering my own question, which was, are there graffiti artists who have created any murals in Burlington? By asking around, following leads. And it's true, there are. And so for me, it's been an organic and continues to be an organic process rather than a kind of a mission-driven quest. I do not see myself as any prime mover on this. So I'm interested in befriending, turning to wonder, making real connections by having hearty conversations with individuals, de-escalating, not criminalizing, and doing a lot less us and theming about it. So I talked with the Lake Champlain Transportation Company CFO, Dale Arango. They're the ones that happened to answer the phone that day. And I learned about the local graffiti artist group Above the Radar. And they organize local artists and artists from away to create those murals. And LCTC, the transportation company, started work with Above the Radar about five years ago. And every year there is an Above the Radar event with painting and music. And this year it's going to be during Art Hop in September on Flynn Avenue. And they will be painting the April Cornell Warehouse, which is owned by, the building is owned by LCTC. So I'd say be there or square, you know, or be square. So it's the weekend of September 8th. I think it will be very lively and it sounds like Karen knows about this. So <clears throat> I've also learned from a friend that Katie Barrett, who was a longtime art teacher, is the person who organized the mini mural paintings that we've seen all over the street level utility boxes in South Burlington. There are now over a hundred of them painted and people from ages seven to 70 have been painting in this project. Um, and I've also noticed some in Burlington, and I don't know about those. I mean, I don't know who painted them. So quickly, what buildings have no graffiti? So the new Y, and inside there's a mural by Juniper Creative that involved a lot of people in the community. City Market, and the entrance and the interior murals are by Tara Goro, and Tara is also the muralist who did the mural in our own ward called River Dwellers Mural in the old East End neighborhood. Yep. Maybe you met her. Um, and I've, I've met her a few times, you know, in the past. Um, and on Tara's website, which is called Wall Tonic, <clears throat> it says, she writes, my mission is to bring more color, <laughs> intrigue, and meaning to our daily, everyday lives with dimension shattering art form known as mural painting. I love that phrase, a dimension shattering art form. <laughs> um, so she's at waltonic.com. And Fletcher Free Library also has murals painted on metal and they're hung high on the building, um, no graffiti. And the deteriorating building on Pine Street, that one level brick building that's adjacent to the Burlington Farmer's Market, also really magnificent Juniper Creative murals. Juniper Creative is a mother, father, grown daughter team of artists. Maybe you've seen them around. They're also having mural on the side of Champlain School. Um, really magnificent work. And I wanna mention one last one, Mary Lacey, who painted that now famous geometric hummingbird from her bucket loader truck high up on the brick wall facing the parking area that used to be the first Ben and Jerry's that was um, built in a converted gas station on the corner of St. Paul and College Streets. So Austin, Texas, Caracas, Venezuela, and Mexico City are all embracers of street art. So here we come, Burlington. Yes? <laughs> anyway, um, I've learned a lot since last we met, and the motivation came from right here. And when the question came up of should we be organizing um, mutual aid to paint over the murals, it just raised all kinds of issues for me. Um, and I talked about the culture of the people 
who I haven't met yet. Um, maybe you have, Karen. Um, but anyway, I am way into this. And I have um, many more slides. And I it's not, you know, I feel like, um, I almost feel like I wish I could have had permission from the people who made those paintings or I had a way of letting them know that I'm doing this. If any of them follow NPA meetings, you know, they could see this on channel 17. Um, I think there are definitely some issues and I think there are ways to work with it. And I applaud, applaud, applaud Lake Champlain Transportation Company, Nectars, and I'm really feeling like there must be some others out there too who are finding ways of supporting um, this group of artists and really celebrating them. Um, so that's what I have to say. Um, thank you. I appreciate it. That's a lot of work. Um, I don't know the original, well, I could only read about because I wasn't around for the original intent of the MPAs, but I think it has something to do with what Cheryl's been taking on with the graffiti project of, um, so I just really appreciate it. I thought that was really beautiful. So thanks, Cheryl. Um, so I thought it was going to be Cindy Cook, but I don't see Cindy here on, um, she had family come in. She had family come in. So would anybody from the beautification NPA working group want to share? Sure. Just like give an update? Yeah. Sure. And Joel can chime in too. Sure. Thank you. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And we can uh, have a, a link that Correct. we can share. And look at you. Um, so Cindy, Carol, Joel, Emily, and myself met, um, I think twice, uh, since the last meeting to talk about different beautification projects that we can do. Um, and there's definitely a lot that can be done in our ward. Um, but we ended up narrowing it down and we felt that some, um, uh, capable projects were, we chose two. One of them is Triangle Park, which is uh, actually where the mural is that you were talking about, um, right? It's actually right here is the mural. And for those who don't, you can't see me pointing, it's um, right on, <laughs> right where the painted crosswalk is. Thank you, Sam. Um, and so with that mural, it just, we felt that it really makes sense to also beautify this park that is um, maintained by the parks department, but can definitely use a lot of TLC and can hopefully bring people there who can utilize it um, and also can hopefully have people of the neighborhood even transplant some of their own plants. So we know there's a lot of people on Front Porch Forum who are like, hey, I've got a lot of stuff in my garden, I need to transplant it. So that's kind of one of the things that we were thinking of was to beautify this area with um, native and drought tolerant <laughs> plants. Um, and then also hopefully um, provide lighting because especially on that walkway from Chase towards Barrett, there's like a couple little yellow dots. That's like a, pr it's a pretty dark um, walkway right there. So I think that specifically would need some lighting. Um, and then we were also thinking about doing um, either a paver or a packed gravel walking paths throughout, just to make it a lot more inviting for for people to come. Um, but there's also another another project. I think. And can I just add? Yeah. So yeah. we we talked about a lot of different ideas, and we there was a good deal. Oh, thank you. There was a good deal of excitement about gardening, um, and or projects that involve gardening, both because we can make something beautiful, like Sam was describing, and then also because people can get involved by sharing their plants, by doing the actual digging and planting on the day, um, and then hopefully pretty low maintenance and like drought tolerant native plants going forward. But 
if people wanted to contribute a little bit of maintenance going forward, that would be possible too. So that's partly what we're excited about with these projects. Um, so um, Chase Street is uh, comes off of Colchester. If you're heading towards Winooski. So this is at the end of Chase Street when you're going to turn right and then go up Grove or Patchen Road. So this is off, this is the corner of Chase and Barrett. And it's Barrett is the one that turns into Grove and Patchen. It's like the, um, there's that back entrance to the Chase Mill, like a driveway over there. Um, I've, I did not know about it at all until, I, I don't live in that, in the East End, but I, but going there, it's like, it's a lovely little square or not square, triangle that could be great. Yeah. And but we, it, right now it's mostly an ash tree, a bench, two beds of daylilies and uh and grass yeah so it's and not it's not very noticeable pat if you wanna i just think that the fact that you don't know where it is shows how much it needs beautified yes <laughs> yes it's got a raggedy um, a raggedy bench that you don't dare sit on but yeah. it's this prime location to just kind of sit there and watch all the traffic and watch people and say hello. And a lot of dog walkers are up and around that yeah. corner. And it's all part of this whole pedestrian powered and people powered neighborhood stuff in the old East End. So, yes. And that was uh, another thing that I was going to touch on. Um, I know that a lot of people were talking about traffic enforcement. And one of the things with this people powered neighborhood is that, yes, while having the police department and other traffic enforcement can help. Permanent infrastructure can help more. If you have speed bumps and uh, speed chicanes and neck downs in your neighborhood, kind of like how, is it Henry Street? That's like right right over here, which we drive, like we took North, over here. North, North, North Street, yeah. North. They, that's so wonderful to help slow down traffic. And implementing those things and also just bringing more people out and providing things for people to use well then you know it's the induce the demand and making if we make this area safer then more people will want to walk around um so another i mean unfortunately the traffic on barrett chase that corner is pretty bad and that's just something that we can't deal with right now but we can provide a really nice place for people of the neighborhood to come. Um, and there's a lot of people of this area, and I know that um, of a lot of people all over the city walk around this area, or they um, visit <clears throat> Chase Mill, go grab lunch. Um, so this is this can be a really nice area for people to utilize, but we also have, um, Sam, I think there's another page. We also have another, um, project location that is actually and these are yeah. not competing these are just two Correct. separate projects that people could get involved with and that we're like really interested in ideas yes and we actually um carol had spoken with someone who is at the it's the hospital administration building which this is the corner of east and colchester um, right across from the um masala restaurant and there is a current flagpole right there. And we already have permission to do gardening implementation. Um, so this is something that we can just, uh, our next steps are to gather kind of like materials and costs and provide that to a list of volunteers who hopefully we'll get tonight. Um, and then this can be something that if we have all the funding and information that we need, this can be like implemented by the end of the month or in July or something. Um, so yes, like Emily said, not competing, um, but this could probably be the um, the closest to implementation to now, like in the summer, because the Triangle Park, we will have to have conversation with the parks department because they do own that parcel. But we do know that from past experience, um, like at Schmanska Park, we have provided um, or the community has planted on the park's land. And um, I think sometimes the community is the one who maintains it. Sometimes the park does as well. But um, I think uh, the park has 
a good relationship with um with this community so i think that they would be willing to allow us to do some implementation on triangle park um and and we don't i'm aware of the time i don't know how much time we have oh, yeah. allotted but we would love to just people who are interested we would love to collect that somehow today and then if there are any thoughts or 100%. people who live in that neighborhood or who know the history of um who would want to share anything else and then did we want to say anything about the sidewalk as well i don't know if we had a picture yeah, or not okay i mean behind that yeah um yeah if you guys have any questions um and then we i have a notebook if people who are interested in um providing some sort of, you know, manual labor or uh, helping out with the planting or helping out with, um, if anybody here has a particularly green thumb and has ideas for what could go here, it's a very sunny location. And um, there, I believe, and anybody who's on East Ave can correct me if I'm wrong, but um, there is the community garden and I think there's currently water that's already there um so we could potentially partner or utilize the water that's there to at least start the planting and then they can just hopefully be drought tolerant the water spout on one of the side buildings yeah okay cool. okay because i wasn't sure if there was one specific to the community garden that's right there so, that's so hi it. I'm Sharon and uh -huh. I'm a community garden person and uh -huh. I live on East Avenue and bonus for you uh, and for us, the building itself that's used to be the state lab that's owned by the medical center has an outside faucet nice. that's right next to the parking lot. And that's separate from the water supply that the city provides to the gardens. But both of those sources I'm sure would be accessible but once again if you use the water supply from the gardens you're talking you have to talk to parks and rec not the hospital <laughs> but if but the hospital i'm sure um that um i gave carol the contact i'm sure there'd be no problem with using the water from that building to water the flowers that you plant okay so i'm positive of that thank so, you you're welcome I just want to say one thing as a gardener um that whole this that neck of the woods is completely infested with bishop weed which is this totally wicked horrible can't get rid of it plant and if you have transplants from gardens if they bring bishop if it's entangled with bishop weed it will take over so just to be really careful about which that. which neck are you talking about like the east of called uh colchester neck of the woods or just it's every it's the inter, if you ever go down to the intervale it's totally infested oh, yeah, the okay. intervale but it's all my neighborhood everywhere around there and i don't live far from that that's okay. Good it's thank everywhere you. Thank you. Yeah. yeah oh yeah i have more questions Yes. Um, so, is there any money to help out with the project, or we're on by yeah, yeah, great. Uh, we got we did get uh, funding from AARP, SD Ireland contributed to it and uh, the UVM uh, uh, Office of uh, Student and Community Relations. So we pieced together, I think it was together, maybe $2,500, $3,000, something like that. So we, yeah, in the old East End. Yeah, we did, we we, we look for grants. So they're, they're out there, and Carter, you've talked about that several times, just, you know, we, we probably need some resources within this group to start helping getting grant money to fund some of these kinds of things. Yep. And I saw so you have Sophie, did you want to go next? Uh, um, you should know that in regard to the Triangle Park, BJ, the head arborist, said two years ago that he was going to put wildflowers all around the edge 
at the time that we took down a broken fence and uh, and that hasn't happened. So definitely it, the next thing to do is talk to him because he might have it on his plan still to do that. And and talk to me, we'll, I'll talk to Sam about the watering because the watering on the Triangle Park was a problem. Yeah, we knew that that would kind of be a little, uh, a little challenging, but um, I think we're hoping that whatever plantings that we can uh, obtain could potentially be drought tolerant. So maybe would need everybody to bring a pail to the to the park uh, just to start them off and then hopefully they'll be okay afterwards. Okay. Any other questions, comments? The one that's going place? It's fantastic. Thank you. Nice work. Um, well, yeah, before folks leave, please, uh, please throw your name down and contact info, probably phone and email, right? Yeah. Um, phone and email as well. We said in the agenda, we were going to talk public safety. Um, I almost am inclined to just wrap at nine o'clock because I think part of the discussion we had last time was about with Zariah, uh, talking about public safety was wanting to expand, and do outreach to bring folks that don't just normally show up to MBAs to have that discussion as well. Um, and I actually do, I see a bunch of new faces, but we didn't like intentionally sort of do that. Um, so I'm inclined to put that on the sort of bike rack for um, September's meeting or a future meeting. I'm seeing nods. Look at that, we ended on time. Um, ooh, I know, well, <laughs> um, all right. Well, I hope everybody has a good summer. Make sure to come out to the picnic. Make sure to get involved with the beautification group.